But um, the broader political situation in both countries, um, Indonesia is going to elect a new president next year after um, SBY's 10 years in power. Uh, Harsia, from your observations of the political situation in Indonesia, what sort of president is Indonesia going to get uh, after uh, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono steps down? I guess, I guess this is very interesting, even for Indonesians as well, because even up until now, uh, unless Jokowi say, I will run, unless Jokowi say, I will run, at least up until today, we don't know, right? Uh, there is no clarity yet who will who will be the next president for Indonesia. Yeah, but if we look into the trend uh, of the leadership in Indonesia uh, these days, the leadership I think what people wants are the leader a leader who understand what the people who the people are. So the Jokowi has set up some good example in Indonesia what we call as blusuan. Yeah. So people who will come to the uh, grassroots and you know talk to the people. So I guess this is the trend now for what kind of leaders that is uh, that the Indonesian people wants. Uh, Partai Demokrat, for example, uh, are talking about Pak Sukarwo from Gubernur Jatim, right? Maybe can be the Partai Demokrat version of Jokowi, for example. So that kind of. Uh, 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 Appetite, yeah, the kind of leader appetite is emerging from Indonesia. Uh, whether military will uh, military uh, person will be popular in Indonesia, uh, perhaps maybe only time will tell. But currently, the Jokowi style leader is uh, more popular at this stage. So uh, you're saying that Indonesians are looking for someone who will first focus internally rather than on external relations with other countries, is that correct? Um, look, if we talk about, say, maybe I can only give the example of Jokowi. Yeah? Uh, Jokowi, when he ran solo, he's very, very investment friendly uh, leader. Investment friendly leader. He, he made uh, uh, investment license within one day only. One door, one day, in solo, right? So, which is great. So, he's trying to do that uh, for Jakarta. So, I guess when we're talking about will the new leader be investor friendly? I think he, I think he will. Yeah. Uh, focusing on internal is something that is very important also for Indonesia at the states. For example, we need a lot of good infrastructure, which we don't, we don't have at the moment, right? So, if we can do that, so if we can address those two. I think we'd be good, be but investment, foreign direct investment, we also know Indonesia is very, very important uh, source of growth for Indonesia. Yeah. Melissa, if I could ask you, the Prime Minister Tony Abbott surprised many by uh, placing such importance on the Australia-Indonesia relationship and particularly how he conducted his first visit, overseas visit to Indonesia. But was it all a pointless exercise? Because he's only going to have to start again with a new leader come next year. And uh, how closely is uh, Australia or this government going to be watching the political machinations in Indonesia um, during the, their election campaign? Uh, they certainly are going to have to be watching closely because uh, Part of the reason Tony Abbott's emphasis was such a surprise is partly because there's been so little focus on, on foreign affairs by Tony Abbott over the past three years in opposition. His uh, efforts and attention have been entirely domestic and even then on a, a very limited field of topics. Um, so for him to suddenly move to a position that for uh, the Australian public is uh, perhaps more associated with a, a Keating era focus on the region was certainly taken by surprise, but for Tony Abbott there was some expectation that he wouldn't be able to make the most of this short period of time where both Tony Abbott <coughs> and Cecilia Bambangu de Yono are in power because he hasn't had that previous attention on that particular relationship. And, and that may well be borne out because uh, as much as 
the meeting that uh, was had was cordial. I don't think you could particularly say it was constructive in any of the, the key areas where they might seek to make changes from Australia's point of view, asylum seekers from both nations' point of views, uh, trade changes or developments when it comes to free trade um, uh, and improvements in agriculture. Good things were said, not much was done. So it was a, a small window of opportunity. Having said that, they have very publicly recognised that it is an important relationship and, uh, and given they have put that emphasis on it from well before they came into government, they have, uh, the coalition had long been talking about wanting to have a, a, a Jakarta-centric approach as opposed to a Geneva-centric approach, would suggest that uh, they will indeed be watching very closely to see who the next leader is. There is promise there that they could have a more constructive relationship, but at the moment, we haven't seen anything to suggest that they can take it to a new level. Deb Nath, uh, President Cecilio Bambang Yudiano in his decade in power has been well received by the international community as well as the domestic population. Um, he's elevated Indonesia to become uh, a regional power. Um, it's, it's chaired ASEAN, it's the strongest economy in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, the next president has big shoes to fill, don't they? And do you see anyone in, on the political scene in Indonesia who can rise up to that challenge, or is there even a better person? Um, as you know, we're in consumer watch mode all the time. That's what we do for a living, and that's our business. We've been polling, just like we do in, in Australia, we've been doing political polling, but not releasing the data, Till we knew that we, we'd got it right. So in a month from now, our monthly political barometer results will come out, and it'll be a national survey. I can tell you from what we've learned over the last three months that Jokowi has a very clear lead, and it signals the people's desire for a change in political culture, not just personality, but culture. People want a grassroots leader to change from what has always been an elitist view of the people, uh, almost a feudal attitude to the voter, and that is going to change with Jokowi, without a doubt. If he gets the job, which he is very likely to do, and the reason I say that he will get nominated is because the party that he represents the leadership of that party understand that it is unlikely they will get this kind of popularity if they skip the 2014 election. It will take, it will strengthen any incumbent and they'll probably have to be sitting in the sidelines for another 10 years. So basically, so he, this is it. he has to strike while the iron This fall. is it. So it would be inexplicable if uh, Megawati does not appoint Jokowi as the candidate for PDIP because they would lose 10 years. Can I um, ask the Indonesian delegates here, do, do you agree? Will Jokowi most likely be a presidential candidate and indeed the next president of Indonesia? Gatot um, Suprianto, I guess I completely agree with the Debna comments that uh, in terms of uh, PDIP uh, political interest, this is the momentum. This is the best moment. And um, this moment to nominate Jokowi as they're uh, um, running for the presidential elections next year. However, some of the people might be very skeptical with this kind of uh, issue because, again, he's not finishing yet his job on Jakarta. It doesn't you know, significantly change what happened actually with Jakarta. He just only ran for year, one year. And it's also raising a lot of issues that um, Jokowi only, uh, he, he left for solo, uh, he, doesn't finish, he didn't finish his uh, second term and moved to Jakarta and he didn't finish it again. And it's kind of uh, um, give a uh, skeptical view about his, his job over there. But yes, I agree the fact that Jokowi is very popular. Um, we need to change the political culture, uh, pe uh, who, a leader who needs the understanding of the grassroots. So uh, that kind of uh, feelings and feel that people what, might need currently. Yeah, so th that's my view on that. Mm. At this point in time, at, at this point in time, he has a clear 10-point lead yeah. over the next candidate. 
and that leads actually growing, the margins growing. So at this point in time, he's unstoppable at this point in time. So, yeah, sorry. Um, just on the, if I could just jump in on the issue of declaring his candidacy, um, I think the thing we need to appreciate here is that uh, within PDIP, uh, Megawati Sakano Putri, the former president, has sole authority to nominate the presidential candidate was granted to her through the party's congress back in 2010. Uh, so although Jokowi is clearly popular, I think uh, has a clear ambition, uh, who wouldn't when they're ahead in the polls uh, to, to run for president, he also needs to be very careful not to, seen, uh, not to be seen to presume to have a right to that role. Uh, and so when we've seen him asked about the presidency, he says it's up to the chairperson of the party, uh, Megawati. When he's asked to comment on national politics, he says, I'm running Jakarta, uh, I'm not going to comment on national issues. And I think that's all part of not being seen to presume that he has a right to be their candidate. Uh, within the party, when I spoke to people back in July, uh, you still uh, very much had a sense that some of the senior figures in the party, in fact, would have preferred to nominate Megawati and perhaps have Jokowi as a vice presidential candidate. Uh, the reasons they gave were things like inexperience on Jokowi's part, whereas this would be an important period for Indonesia, transitioning from uh, a long period of Yudhoyono's rule into, into a new era. But it was hard to escape the impression that for a lot of those people who opposed Jokowi uh, as, as a presidential candidate, they were worried about how he might change the party and how that would affect their position within the party. Uh, when I asked again uh, just before giving a talk on this in September, uh, the sense was very much that that idea of not nominating him was losing ground uh, within the party. Uh, he was given a prominent role uh, at uh, sort of the party's national meeting in September and some of the people who had been expressing those sort of views were, were much more guarded when I asked them again then. So I do think he is uh, gaining ground. Um, if we go to, uh, I think, whoever's elected president, and certainly uh, Compass, I think, is the, the one polling agency that has publicly released uh, two sets of polls that compare Jokowi and the other front-runner, Prabowo Subianto, a former general who was dismissed uh, from the military just after Sahado fell and was also formerly Sahado's uh, son-in-law. Uh, back in December last year, Jokowi had a narrow lead in their polls, 18 to 13 per cent. Uh, but when they did it again in June, it was more like 33% to 15%. And I think this has been a real feature of Jokowi's rise as presidential frontrunner, is before he emerged on the scene, uh, Megawati and Prabowo were the frontrunners, but their popularity never got out of about mid-teens uh, when they were polled. Uh, and I think there was an overall sense uh, that Indonesia could be heading in 2014 to an uninspiring set of candidates. Uh, before the previous presidential election, the parties had set a nomination threshold of 20% of the seats or 25% of the valid votes in the preceding general election to be able to nominate a candidate. Uh, that means realistically you can only have three or four candidates in each election. Mm. Uh, back in 2009, that meant you had an incumbent president, Yudhoyono, running against a former president, Megawati, against uh, incumbent vice president, uh, Yusuf Kala. And uh, when you looked to 2014, it looked like you would have Prabowo, uh, a general dismissed from the military that a lot of people would have disquiet over his human rights record. Uh, Megawati, who had twice lost in direct presidential elections. Uh, Abu Riz al-Bakri, a business tycoon who uh, has a very black mark on his record with the public in Indonesia because of the Lapindo mud disaster in East Java. Uh, and at, uh, President Yudhoyono had not groomed a successor at that point, so perhaps an unknown Democrat successor. And I think that was leading to a, a broad mood of disillusionment uh, within the electorate, uh, something that Jokowi has really captured, again, presenting that, uh, as uh, some of our panelists have mentioned, that new uh, style of political communication, a man of the people image, uh, that uh, I think has really contributed to his popularity. And indeed, when, people in, when you ask people in Indonesia, uh, what will it take for the next president to win, uh, that people often use the word antithesis, that the next president will be the antithesis of President Yudhoyono, who for all of his having presided over a long period of stability and strong economic growth in Indonesian politics, I think is perceived now uh, as cautious, stiff, indecisive on many issues. And so Prabowo, I think, presented an uh, image as a leader who was firm, and that seemed to be to his benefit. Uh, before Jokowi rose and, and, and again came up with this man of the people image that I think really comes as something new for, for many voters at a time when there is a mood for change in Indonesia. 
Uh, just if I could add one final thing, uh, I think whoever is the next president, there are, there are really two issues there. Uh, when you look at an Indonesian polity that's undergone a fundamental transi uh, transition to democracy over the last 15 years, uh, but there's a real sense that reforms have stalled and there are some entrenched defects. Uh, one is the question of whether uh, the new president will be of a mind to try to change that. And I think at the moment, uh, uh, it's difficult for us to say with uh, Jokowi, he's, he's, he will run on a reform image and that will generate public pressure on him, uh, but we don't know a lot about his uh, uh, policy stance on, on a range of issues uh, because he won't comment not being the candidate. Um, the, the second question though is, and let's assume uh, that we do get a reform-minded president as the next president in Indonesia, is whether they're going to be able to push through change uh, against the resistance of entrenched interests. Uh, because again, a feature of Indonesian politics is that throughout the democratic era, the president has always been elected with minority parliamentary support. Uh, all democratic era presidents have tried to address that by forming a broadly representative cabinet that includes most of the major parties in parliament, but that's never been an effective strategy to keep those parliaments on side. Uh, when Yudhoyono formed a uh, rainbow coalition, as we call it, for this term, Basically, on day one of the government, you already had other parties criticising government policy, even though, in theory, they were part of the administration. Uh, and so I think if, uh, if say, a Jokowi were elected with a strong popular mandate with that mood for change, uh, then really uh, an interesting step that he could take would be to try to marshal that mood to pressure some of the entrenched interests and keep a more narrowly representative cabinet rather than bringing everyone inside the government team. Harsia, um I want to ask you, in your view, who is the best man or woman for the job, economically speaking? You're an expert in Indonesia's uh, micro and macro economic situation. Indonesia's growing um, at a, a very enviable 6% um, each year. It's um, going to eclipse a one trillion economy, you believe, in a year's time. Um, who is the best person to manage this booming economy in, um, that is Indonesia? <clears throat> okay, um, but perhaps to before I answer that, maybe to add what Dave has said, I think what is very important, uh, what is very interesting to watch about Jokowi today as well, is that he is also a minority at DPRD Jakarta, right? Uh, the PDIP and mm. is also a minority. But what is very interesting is that uh, Jokowi has managed to get the press to watch what he does, yeah. So that even the DPRD is not able to control him, yeah? Because he's, the people are behind him. Every time he go blue suan, he bring the press with him. Yeah? Every time he put a policy, the press is also with him, right? So when the DPRD is not too happy with what he's doing, the people will stand behind him. So I, I hope uh, uh, this uh, rainbow coalition, hmm. yeah? or what in Indonesia we call it the politik dagang sapi, yeah? uh, will not no need to happen again when Jokowi mm. is there, mm. yeah? And leading to answer your question, mm. if, if we have a leader that can do that and put a really professional into the cabinet, right? I think Jokowi can be the right person to do it, yeah? That's, very, that's very interesting because you're implying that Jokowi doesn't have the skills himself to yes. run the country's economy. Because look, we need a lot of experts to run the economies, yeah. Currently, Pak Khatib Basri is doing a very good job, yeah. Uh, with this 2013, we are seeing a lot of uh, investors turning away from Indonesia. If you look into the JCI, the Jakarta Stock Exchange, uh, in Q1, 28 trillion came into Indonesia. Now, 9 trillion is out of Indonesia. So, the whole 28 trillion went out from Indonesia market, and then 9 trillion from last year's money of 15 trillion went out from the Indonesian market. Yeah? Why? Okay, because of this macroeconomic issue that we, that we saw in Indonesia, current account is at deficits in Indonesia. Entering 2013, we know that we have to address the current account deficit. We actually almost addressed this before it ran, before it ran into deficit in 2012 when the government want to raise the fuel price, reducing the subsidy, reducing BBM import, yeah? But that effort failed miserably in the parliament, uh, in the DPR, in the DPR, yeah? in the DPR. 
2012, the vote was not to raise the fuel price. Come 2013, the current account is in deficit, and we know we have to fix it. The easiest way to fix it, raise fuel price, because then we need, we need to import less, uh, less BBM, yeah, less uh, fuel to Indonesia. Now, but maybe the government worked a little bit too slow, yeah, because they have the power. In 2012, DPR gave the government the power to raise the fuel price in 2013 without consulting to DPR. Yeah? In terms of timing, the best time was in March and April when uh, panen, well, when, when harvest season comes. Yeah? So inflation is soft, food inflation is soft, then you can add that fuel inflation. But the, the decision making process was so slow so that it's only raised in June uh, 17th. And because of that, inflation comes during Lebaran, during the Hari Raya season. Mm. Then inflation really sh shot very, very high. Meanwhile, in that period, in that period when current account running in deficit, the foreign reserve is used to protect rupiah. Yeah? When July came, the foreign reserve dropped below the psychological level of 100 billion. So that's why a lot of the foreign investors from the portfolio of foreign investors get out from Indonesia, both in bonds and also in equity, right? So because of that uh, issue, Khatib Basri came, right? He was elected as the Ministry of Finance, and he quickly addressed a lot of this issue, yeah, about the nationalism issue, about the economic po uh, policies. He quickly uh, uh, addressed that. He reversed a lot of the Indonesian uh, uh, economic policy who are too protection protective, yeah. Uh, he does that within weeks. And now we see that uh, his bet, Khatib Basri's bet, that the high inflation is only temporary. Uh, in September, we see Indonesia in a deflation mode. So inflation is tame, yeah. Uh, foreign reserve also increase. How high is inflation at the moment? We are running at 7.75 inflation year to date. Year to date, year on year is about eight point something, but year to date is about seven point seven five. I think we'll close at nine, which is as uh, predicted, because of this. But what worried was in July or August, inflation for that month only is three percent. Yeah, so that becomes that makes the foreign investor also worry, right? Will it run to ten percent inflation? Yeah. So the bet of uh, Khatib Basri was correct that it is only temporary. We think. Uh, we hope that this month can be another a deflation. So if inflation is in control, uh, the Khatib Basri team is doing the right, is mm. doing the right thing. Yeah. But Khatib Basri is also the student of Ibu Sri Mulyani. Yeah, Ibu Sri Mulyani. Right? Uh, Ibu Sri Mulyani, of course we have a lot of respect for Ibu Sri Mulyani, yeah? but uh, sayangnya, yeah, sayangnya, Ibu Sri Mulyani is not too popular in the political uh, states. Yeah, with the bank century bailout. Yeah. So to answer your question, the economy is complex. Mm. Yeah. So he will not be able to run it by himself. He needs a team, he needs a professional team to run this. Right. And if if he's able to do this without doing the rainbow coalition mm. or the politic Dagang Sapi, yeah, uh, I think if we have a, a, a good professional to run this, we'll hit a home run. Yeah. Are you prepared to name any presidential candidates who, who could fill that role? I think it's Jokowi. You do? Okay, yeah. excellent.